All right. Now it's time for the main event. Sorry, I don't have the music, but in case you, in case people want to say, dum 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 dum, we have our main event on Facebook. There has been an argument that has been going back and forth for a number of months. Which one is better? Is it wholesaling? Is it licensed agenting? Well, you're going to get to see some of the best in the business talk about the different aspects of wholesaling and agenting for real estate investors. I do want you to understand, especially if you're a newbie, it's not going to settle the argument. What it is going to do is give you information that you can make good and informed decisions about. You're going to have to decide after everything's said and done what you're most comfortable with. I know we've got experienced investors in here that are still going to say, oh, I'm going with a license agent all the, every time and I'm still, still there. But you may at least consider going to a wholesale. Either way, Rich is not endorsing one side or the other. We're just giving the arena so that the contest can be decided by our, I don't want to call them pugilists unless there's blood. But first off, I want to introduce to you, you ladies and gentlemen, the members of our panel. I'm going to have to cheat and look at their names because, because otherwise I don't remember everything. That's why I have paper for them. But first. On our panel, we have Mr. Gerald, okay, L. Ayler. Thank you, Gerald. Gerald Ayler is going to be a attorney. In some sense, he's also going to be like a referee, but you know, you know how people hate referees, but either way, he's going to be in the middle of it. Next, we have Derek Burrell. Derek uh -oh. Buy a crowd, buy a crowd. Good. Okay, if, you, if, you're, if you're famous, then you can yell for them. We've got Sam Craven. <laughs> We've got Alvin Glenn. <laughs> Next up, Joe Comicelli. lined up according to which side that they're on, but either way, it's going to be a battle royal. It's going to be bloody. Pick a, pick a chair, pick a side. It doesn't really matter. Do I have, do I need a chair? No, don't hit him with the chair. Oh, okay. All right. Gentlemen, what I'm going to do is ask you first off is, I've already introduced your names, but I, I'm going to say, uh, we give each of you a chance to introduce yourselves, uh, tell what side you're on. I also want you to give out your contact information. Well, we're going to repeat the contact information afterward. But first off, tell me who you are, how long have you been in real estate, how do I get in touch with you? We're going to start from this end and work our way down to the other side. Uh, Chris Funk, been in real estate about nine years now. You can get in touch with me uh, on email, chris at funkdeals.com. What else did you want to know? Wholesaler, uh, investor, rehabber, rental property, apartments, owner finance, kind of all that kind of good stuff. Not a realtor. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Way to get started. Way to get started. Yeah. yeah. I'm Joe Tomaselli. Joe Tomaselli, I'm a wholesaler and investor. Uh, my company, you can reach me at Joe Buys Houses 281 uh, at Gmail. Uh, I've been doing this for about five years. Hi, my name is uh, Alton Glenn. Uh, I'm a wholesaler and investor. Uh, primarily do wholesale as well as do uh, selling finance. Um, pretty much, yeah, that's it. I'm like realtors all day. How do we get in touch with the Alton? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, contact uh, information is Alton at the Altex Group dot com. Um, also, uh, any information that I have, you can find on that. Wait, Alton? Alton at the Altex Group. T H E A L T E X Group. G R O U P dot com. 
I'm Derek. I'm, my name is Derek Morrell. I've been an uh, investor for two and a half years. Do a lot of wholesaling assignments. Um, I hope to do an owner finance, wrap around mortgages, things like that. You can contact me at Derek at goodfaithhomebuyers.com. That's F A I T H, goodfaithhomebuyers.com. Um, that's also my website, and I have never been good at glamour shots, so I'm definitely not a realtor. <laughs> All right, so my name is Gerald Ayler, J E R E L E H L E R T. I'm a licensed attorney in the state of Texas. I started bird dogging and post selling in 2002 with the Rich Club. Um, love the Ayler transactions. I I uh, got stupid with the law school in 2012. I got licensed as an attorney in the state of Texas recently. And uh, back into the real estate market. So my name is Gerald Ehlert, J-E-R-E-L. Last name is E-H-L-E-R-T. My phone number is 832-524-1173. And my email address is Gerald at GeraldEhlert.com. Me and that mic back on this side. That's, that's a wholesaler mic. Now, now we have My name is Sam Craven. Uh, name of our company is Senate House Buyers. We've been in business for about uh, three years or so. Um, we do wholesaling, we do renovations. Uh, people always like to ask us what kind of projects do we like. We say we do anything from $2,000 to well over a million. And that's the wholesale or renovate and sell. Uh, in the last two and a half years, we've done about 140 houses or so, 150, I haven't counted lately. Um, and we're really business focused, business mindset. Um, we think of our wholesaling and rehab company as a marketing and sales company, first and foremost. Uh, anyhow, full disclosure, we've been in business, I'd like I told you, two and a half, three years. I only just got my license in February. So I'm gonna speak a little bit to both sides. I can certainly understand both sides of it, but I am uh, pretty firmly on the, you should be licensed side, so. Uh, You're on notice. Uh, so anyhow, uh, my contact information is Sam at SenateHouseBuyers.com. Uh, oh, excuse me. Sam at SenateHouseBuyers.com. And I'll spell it. Sam. S-E-N-N-A HouseBuyers.com. Spell it. Does anyone out here know how to spell house buyers? Okay, we're good there. SenateHouseBuyers.com as well is our uh, web address if you want to get on there and learn anything about us. Hi guys, my name is Ryan DeGenero. I'm here from Core Management Group. We are a retail brokerage that specializes in helping investors who don't have time to send out postcards and do their marketing, find deals, typically off the MLS, but we also offer wholesale deals every once in a while. Uh, I've been a real estate and business brokerage for 12 years now. Um, you can contact me or any of my agents on our website. We have all of our contact information posted at my core online. That's N Y C O R E O N L I N E dot C O N. Okay, so my name is Tom Perry. In uh, October of, 23rd, no, of uh, 2010, I started a, a, a general contracting company called Fast Track. Uh, the end of last year, I gave that business away to my brother, my dad, and Elijah, who now run the business. Uh, July of 2013, uh, Jason Bible and I started Houston House Buyers. Uh, we marketed for the first 90 days to get our first property. We bought seven properties in 2013. We bought 67 properties in uh, 2014, and we'll do about 90 properties by the end of the year uh, for 2015. Uh, we own a, a Houston House Buyers, and we also started recently a, another marketing company called Sellers Your House. I became a, uh, a real estate agent when I was a general contractor, primarily because uh, in the state of Texas, if you're an inspector, you're licensed by TREC, and you're regulated, but if you're a general contractor, you're not regulated by anybody. 
And so there's some good general contractors out there and there's some bad ones. I wish that there was more regulation uh, because you know it makes it easier for the good guys doing business if there's regulation. But because there is no regulate, regulatory authority on general contractors, the good guys are always competing with the bad guys, which is, I think, what's going to become the conversation here is that right now wholesaling is not a regulated business, but and real estate agents are regulated. And I think that's where the debate's going to be in, is that it's regulation versus non-regulation. And should we self-regulate or should the state step in and start regulating? And if we don't do things right, the state will step in. Um, my contact information is tom at houstonhousebuyers.com. I think y'all can spell all of those words. If you can't, then you should probably not be a real estate investor. <laughs> or for sure you're made for wholesaling. <laughs> I became a real estate agent um, primarily to have access. What, what I found is as my general contracting business was growing, is it was hard to coordinate meeting with an investor and the real estate agent that was the listing agent and, uh, and, and being there at the appropriate time for a, mainly foreclosures back then. We were a vendor for Lifestyles and also a vendor for Rich Club. And, and so it's just a matter of coordinating in that if I'm a licensed agent, general contractors don't have the same access that agents have to, to properties. And so I didn't want to become an inspector because there was a conflict between being an inspector and a general contractor. Um, so I wanted to become an agent just to have access to the property. But since then, it's, it's transitioned very nicely into being the, on the investor side of things to be able to have access to the, the proper kind of data. All right, so Tom, you've already answered the, the first question of why, why be a licensed agent. So why would you not be a licensed agent? Or why do you think they became agents? So let's, now remember, guys, whoever controls the mic controls the stage for a second. So why would you not become a licensed agent? Or why, why would you be a wholesaler? Um, so this is something I feel pretty strongly about. In the very beginning, these were the first rooms where I got started. And I didn't know jack shit. And I was completely broke. So I walked in here and they said, look, here's what you could do. I wanted to be a landlord. I wanted to run apartments. I wanted to flip portfolios. And they said, no, you're broke. You don't know anything. You have no knowledge or experience. You've got to be a wholesaler. So I dived in. I would come to these rooms like five nights a week. I'd come to every single meeting that the Rich Club had, and mainly on wholesaling. And I would sit in the back of the room and I'd talk to guys and I'd say, how does it work? What can I do? And they said, well, you have to pretty much be a wholesaler. So all you can do as a wholesaler is you can find deals for other people that need help. And the one thing about a wholesaler is you've got to be a good negotiator. Because these guys could go out on the market. This was like 2006 and 2007 when I was starting to get my feet wet and do my first deals. People could go out and find deals on MLS kind of back then. There were other ways to find deals. So if they're going to come buy something from you, it had to be a screaming hot deal. You had to be able to go out and negotiate something, make that seller happy enough to go, yeah, I'm willing to, to give you a contract with $10 earnest money, no real assurance that you're going to close, and trust you that you're going to bring them a buyer that's going to do the deal. So um, they said, look, you know, you, you got, you're charged with a huge responsibility. This is tough. Then you've got to get a, a cash buyer that you don't know to come in and close this deal within 10 days. This is very hard to do. So to do this, you've got to negotiate hard. Now, do you want to go in as a licensed agent and go, hey, by the way, I'm a licensed agent. And technically, I'm offering you about half of what your property is worth. And here's why. Here's all the reasons why you should sell it for a whole lot more money. You have to do that as a licensed agent. So I was like, no way. Why would I ever want to become licensed and have all these disclosures and all these other rules I have to follow, which basically stand in the way of me doing my job? So I felt pretty passionately about that. And that's my whole reason for being here is I was like, guys, if they start making us become licensed, we now have to have all these other things. It's like the debate that uh, Dale Earnhardt and I had online, talking about uh, hot coffee and all this stuff. You know, you spill hot coffee on yourself. Should we have to be licensed to have a hot coffee in our hand? Should I have to carry a card that says I know how to carry a coffee? Or should McDonald's have to put out a sign that says this shit could kill you? It's hot. Like, don't pour it on your lap. Like, where is this going to stop, right? I'm a negotiator. I'm a deal maker. If you're willing to make a deal with me, and you're willing to make a deal with me, and I can put this together in a way that we're all happy, why should I have to have a license to do that and do some other kind of weird stuff that's going to completely spoil the deal? So that's how I feel about it. So there's a point. I'm going to make a counterpoint. So when I started as a general contractor, 
I saw wholesalers. I remember New Western and Network were two of the first wholesalers that I saw. And then I saw other guys like Chris and, and, and guys like that. And you know what you really have to realize is that on every single property that's available to be marketed, there's uh, five different types of potential buyers for that property, right? And, and there's a scale or gradation in terms of what they can afford to pay. The people that can always pay the most for a piece of property is a, a retail owner occupant, right? They can always negotiate, they can pay 95% of retail price and brag to all the neighbors about what a great deal they got, right? But then next after that are buy and hold investors. If a buy and hold investor is ever going up against a retail buyer, they're gonna lose, right? But a buy and hold investor can pay the second most. They're typically right now paying 85 to 90% of ARV minus the cost of repairs. And they, they, they're the next tier. The next tier after that are typically flippers. Flippers can typically pay 70 to 75% of ARV minus the cost of repairs. The next below that are gonna be wholesalers. Wholesalers are gonna be buying at, if they're selling to a buy and hold investor, they've gotta be able to buy below that 85 or 90% to be able to offer value. And if they're selling to flippers, they've gotta be able to offer it below 70% to be able to find deals. If they're not doing that, they're not offering true value. So here's where it really comes down to, is that real estate agents are held to a particular standard, right? There's a, a standard of ethics, you have to take ethics courses, all that. Wholesalers aren't held to that standard. But and as ethics. long as the consumer is being taken care of, that's really not gonna matter, okay? And what I'm saying is that if you look at the history of real estate investing in the marketplace, there used to be some things that we could do relatively easy, like owner financing. And what's happened to owner financing recently? Owner financing in the round one, sir. In the round one. Sorry, I had to cut you off though. I gotta hear from somebody else. What else, anybody else got it? You, oh, you got the mic on this side. All right, go ahead. So, I want to elaborate a little bit about what Chris was saying just earlier uh, in the beginning. So, you know, I, I'm really, to be honest with you, I don't really hate realtors. You, know, you get annoying sometimes, I have to say. One of them is one of my close friends, but yeah, at the end of the day, man, you, you as a wholesaler starting out, at least for me, most wholesalers starting out, don't have very much capital. You know, I, I had to, you know, bootstrap it. I, I always joke around with my friends over there and I show my arm, I literally gave blood, sweat, and tears. Like I quit my job, donated 15, uh, 15. <laughs> so I, I would donate my blood, 15, 20 dollars worth twice a week, just so I could have money to put in my gas tank to go look at properties. And I would do this because I didn't have an op another option. You know, being a realtor, you have to, you know, pay for realtor school, right? You have to you have to do that kind of thing. Well, I didn't have that opportunity. The, the, the opportunities for me weren't very able. So at the time, you know, wholesaling worked out for me. So my thing, my argument is, you can start out very, very, very cheap. It doesn't really get cheaper than donating your blood, right? <laughs> so, I was literally driving a 1996 Toyota Camry and the front brakes really didn't work. I had to like, like hit the emergency <laughs> brake, dude. It was ridiculous. And, and, and some of my friends in here know. So I had to bootstrap it. So my argument is, as a wholesaler, you can get started very, very cheap. And you can actually build a great business. And some of these guys here on the side of uh, wholesalers, we've done that. You know, we've used business principles. We've educated ourselves. You know, the argument is also, you know, yeah, there's going to be some idiots out there that are wholesalers. There's going to be idiot realtors too, you know, but yeah, they're, they're regulated. But who's really always watching, right? Who's, who's standing right behind them? Well, you know what I, what I want to do now is that build on what you, what you said. How much does it really cost to get started in real estate? And we're not talking about the guru hype of says no money, no credit, no job, no nothing. We're just saying how much do you need to spend? to get started, or, or, or how much do you need to spend on, on training? So, I want to... Can I just throw one thing out there to answer that real quick? Okay, you got, you got one so, thing real quick. I, I know the Rich Club does not endorse this. I do not endorse this myself. It's Joe Tom Selly. We put out 100 bandit signs with one of my new students. Will you stand up, Kelly, please? Um, can you say to the group how much money you spent to get those 100 signs? 
And how much will you net? Off of is your, it one hundred twenty-seven dollars? Yes. And how much will you net off of your first deal that you just got after those hundred signs? After the hundred signs, I will net uh, five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars off of one hundred and twenty-five. Not a bad return, right? All right. All right. Yes, sir. I'd like to say something in full disclosure that a lot of gurus and a lot of people at this table do not say, and that is... Bandit signs are illegal in the state of Texas anytime, anywhere, any county. And it's $500 per sign per day. So somebody could spend 5000 put out signs. There's a lot of volunteers around that go monitor these signs, take pictures of them, turn them into the county attorney's office, Vince Ryan's office, and there are people that have incurred $100,000 in fines. So you look at your business model and see what you want to do. Now you can take that gamble and also know that you're breaking the law. So bandit signs are illegal and nobody wants to say that. Uh, actually, no, wait, 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 it's not an endorsement from which club, he's, he's giving it as an example, but everybody has to make that decision for themselves. Now I would like to hear from, thank you so much, thank you Bob for that, and that is, that is a very important point about that. I, Bob, I appreciate you saying that, uh, but I would like to say that I'd like to try to keep this thing on track for, you know, real. we can do bandit signs all day long. Uh, everyone on the stage has probably done them at some point in their career, but I would like to touch uh, a little bit more on uh, what we talked about earlier is having the fiduciary responsibility like, like uh, Mr. Funk discussed of having to disclose basically what you said, right? Where we as agents, have to disclose and say, we are buying your house at a discount to what it's worth, right? And that can be a deal killer, what, uh, what Funk was talking about. But something that we train all of our salespeople to do is to disclose that stuff. You know, anytime someone is, we, the part of the market that we, as everyone in this room operates in, is maybe 5% of the total volume that goes on in the city of Houston, or, or frankly in the US, I'm sure that varies, but we have to find a way and we have to find the people that are no longer valuing money as much as time and convenience, right? If they could have fixed this house that you just walked through, they would have done it. They can't or don't want to. So when we train our salespeople to go out, we'll tell them, I show them comps. I say, I'm gonna make this much money. I'm going to sell your, I'm going to, we're going to buy it for this much, we're going to put this much in it, and we're going to make this much money. And frankly, most of the time I ask them, uh, one of my favorite sales tools is, as a percentage, what percent do you think would be fair for me to make when I renovate this house? And they'll usually say somewhere between you know, 10 and 20%. Well guys, those are our margins. We can back into that really easy. So while it's certainly a negative what you're discussing, I don't think it has to be a deal killer. Uh, we use it as a way to build rapport and to be completely open about everything. Uh, so that was just a couple cents on that that I wanted to get in. All right, Hope, before we go to the, our, our next speaker, is, uh, you had a, a question or a statement? Well, it's off subject. Let's just move on. All right, no, thank you. All right. Okay, good, good answers, guys. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, real quick question. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Go ahead, please. One thing he said. Uh, 5% was the number you gave uh, probably the wholesale deal versus your transactional deals that are occurring all throughout Houston. Right? I was just thinking like <coughs> investment properties where we're buying to renovate and sell or buying for a second or third property or investment, whatever. Yeah, well, about my, 5%. my point here is that wholesale deals represent a very, very, very small percentage of all of the real estate transactions that are happening. So do you want to be part of that 5% of the volume, or do you want to be part of the other 95% or 92% that doesn't count the private transactions? So although you may stand a chance to make more money uh, on one particular deal, you certainly have a better chance of creating higher volume by being licensed. Your marketing is going to reach a lot more people. We want the same deals they want as wholesalers, but we can also have the other gamut as well. We can still wholesale and list these things retail, so the profitability on our side as you scale is a lot higher as well. Now when you guys when you 
count the, the basic uh, I know, cost of, of hiring a licensed agent versus the cost of having a real uh, a, a wholesaler. How, how do those costs, uh, you know, as, as a buyer going through an agent or as opposed to going through a, a wholesaler, how do those costs compare? You know, because, you know, I think of licensed agent, I think 6% immediately. Uh, I think wholesaler, I think four or $5,000. Uh, is, is that correct, or how, how do those costs line up? Okay. Well, yeah. It, I mean, just, just, you know, just go through that as an agent in our process. company, if we're dealing with someone direct and out on the MLS, we're not taking a commission. We're just disclosing that we're agents. So I don't think the, I mean, I've had deals, we don't do them anymore, where I would have been better off being the agent. Make $2,500 on a wholesale fee, we don't do that anymore. Those deals come across my desk, I send the, the buyer's agent back out and say, try again. Uh, so as an agent, yes, and we had a deal come up, well, we, we put under contract this week. It's a 700 something thousand dollar deal. Well, it's an MLS deal, so we're making 20 something thousand just buying the dang thing. And then we're gonna renovate it and make money on the back end as well. So I, I'm not sure that there's a right or wrong answer to the question that you asked, because everything that we wholesale, you know, we've made $30,000 on a wholesale fee on a $10,000 house. Then it'd have been better to be the wholesaler. And then we've had other ones where it would have been more economical if we were the agents. Um, so I don't think it's a one or the other so much as, yeah. Yeah, but uh, honestly, honestly yeah, yeah, it does, uh, it does actually predict, uh, depend on the deal. However, um, speaking in, in terms of what we were talking about earlier, uh, as far as, okay, yes, you do have, uh, obviously investment properties are 5% of the, of the market as is now. Um, however, at the end of the day, you have to understand that, yes, that, that means that you're also doing a lot more running around for quantity deals. You know, on, on a typical wholesale deal, or at least, uh, I speak for myself here, um, obviously, numbers do vary. Um, however, I mean, I can make anywhere from, you know, 10, 20, possibly even $30,000 on a deal. Yeah, we do have smaller deals, but at the end of the day, um, get, especially given the, the, the market situations now, where smaller houses are, are more, uh, are in more quantity as far as for transactions wise. Um, you're talking about as a real estate agent making, you know, whatever, even if it was going to be the full 6%, uh, on a $100,000 house, you're making $6,000 on that deal. You're running around a lot more, you're doing showings, so on and so forth. Not saying that we don't do showings, absolutely. We do do open houses um, when, when necessary and so on and so forth. However, at the end of the day, I, do I want to I want to ask myself as far as for my time and effort, where do I value that? Where do I do I value that in in the bigger transactions or do I value that on making uh, three thousand dollars on a on a fifty thousand dollar house the max? Right. So the the other side of that equation that um, we kind of left out is so what are we making on the deal as a realtor how much can we make on it as a wholesaler how much can we make on it and what's better for us then you have the flip side of the coin what's better for the consumer what's better for the home seller and I think that's really where a lot of our debate started like on Facebook was you know how is how are our, our, our customers actually being served here are they not being served is there a segment of the market that realtors really don't like to mess with that the majority of realtors don't get very involved with. And I think we all kind of agree that wholesale is a niche that is really underserved by, by the real estate market in general, by realtors. And so that's why this has kind of created such a good environment for wholesalers because it's not feasible for a realtor to come out and do what a wholesaler does for a three or a 6% commission. It needs to be a deal maker's environment where we can come in and go look, We've got to go track down nine different dead people to get them to sign airship affidavits. Then we got to come in and get this lien removed off your property. Then we got to do all this other kind of stuff just to make this deal work. I've got to buy it at this because I know I can sell it somewhere around this, which leaves me a profit of this, and I think that's fair for the amount of work I'm doing. And if they can agree to that, I'll get your question in a second. Then I think that's a fair deal. So I think that's one of the biggest things that we have to think about is how is this part of the market going to be served? And then to speak to the other side of the question, who's going to make more money? If you're just a wholesaler, then I think Ryan made a really good point. If all you're doing is wholesaling, you're passing up on a lot of stuff. But if you're an investor and you're basically trying to buy properties to hold as rentals, you're going to do owner finance on some, then you're going to do retail flips on the others, and you're just wholesaling the ones you don't want to keep and just using that as, a, as an exit to monetize leads that don't really work for your portfolio, 
I think that the investor is going to outpace the realtor nine times out of ten. Yeah. Because that investor is going to make $200,000, $500,000 on a rental property over the course of the property's lifetime. So I think it really depends on what business model you're running. And then again, if you're a realtor or a broker, you've got 76 agents working underneath you, you're going to outpace the, the investor. So it really just depends on the size of your operation, what your strategy is to, to make money, what your business model is. Uh, but that's just kind of some food for thought that I think yeah. can, can turn things up. I don't think real, anyone can realistically argue business models up here. Every single one of us on stage operates our business differently, but no one on here does it wrong, if that makes sense. Uh, our business, I'm not in the business of being a real estate agent. I'm an agent, but if they start bringing me $100,000, $50,000 listings, I'm going to be upset. Because we're going to work just as hard as those as we are on the ones we make ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 wholesale fees on. So I don't necessarily think that, uh, I think it kind of went back to the point you made earlier, the debate seems to be more about how do we best serve the people and do it around what laws and what ways can we regulate it. Uh, I have a question yeah. and a comment. And I've bought, my, I'm Rambo, I've been investing for eight years. I bought properties from a lot of you guys. I love all of y'all, I love everybody that brings me a deal, okay? I don't care who you are. Here's my comment. As an investor, this concerns me a lot. I'm also a lawyer. You'll see why this concerns me in a minute. Um, Somebody, there's been a trend over the last couple of years, which I would like addressed directly, from wholesalers who say, okay, you can have this deal, put $2,000, put $3,000 in my pocket. No, you can't send it to the title company. I want it in my pocket. Sometimes those are wholesalers I've never heard of. Sometimes those are people who are just starting. This is where oversight <laughs> regulations, <coughs> regulations and statutes do help. If that wholesaler is a real estate agent, I have redress. If they run away with my two or three thousand dollars, they're listed somewhere. So if I have competing deals as an investor and I can put my earnest money with a title company, for a wholesaler, great, no problem. It's going to be fair. If I've got a wholesaler who says put it in my pocket, they are one down from a wholesaler that's actually an agent who actually has a real address and a real phone number and a real identity. So how do you wholesalers, what the hell is going on? Why are you guys over here saying, oh, you can trust me, put 3,000 in my pocket. And you know what? Who has had a deal fall apart? Do they all okay, wait, work? Rambo, wait, we got, I, is that, how so many we got times, the first question though. But the observation is that deals fall apart all the time. Okay, but we and gotta, my we wholesaler gotta has a $3,000, $5,000 in the pocket. Hold on, hold on, we gotta have an answer here. I gotta, I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta, I'm I'm willing, y'all go for it. Okay, go ahead, I gotta, I gotta. Yes, sir. answer. We've, we've actually done a deal, by the way. Yeah, we are. We're closing. And I'm closing no, one with... He, he talked, not me. Yeah. Uh, we, got, we got two we're closing, I know. Yes, I know. Yeah. Right. First off, <laughs> I, I don't sell real estate, so I'm selling my equitable interest. Technically, if my spread's five or six or seven K, I should get that when we sign the contract, right? Yeah. Because I'm assigning my equitable, right. it's a, a, equitable title. So... I disagree. Anyway. Well, but, you know... Are you a lawyer? It, if I'm going to clear up title issues, I'm doing that because I know how to do it. And chasing down airships and doing all, all that stuff, some of that's a lot of hard work. But really, I'm, I'm giving someone my equitable interest. Technically, I don't have any more interest in that deal. So, then, well, but, but, but I'm, I'm, there's, there's always equity if you're wholesaling. Not if you can't close, but you're, you're purely in the case of the deal, if I bring you a deal for 50, I made it for 50, I sell it for you for 60, the equity is, the equity for the person who has the equitable interest in the deal is 10000 The contract is contingent upon... I'm not on his side for just giving up all the money in the front. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm not on his side. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I got, I got to get in between. In the between. contract is okay. contingent upon having equity. You're not selling me a piece of paper. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. It, 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 we've gotten into the... Into, uh, into what? <laughs> <laughs> Can't have the audience throwing chairs. I just need these guys throwing chairs. 
All right, go, uh, go. We, we got the drill. You want to give an answer? Hopefully. All right. He's going to give a response. A response. Not answer. So I'm an attorney. I did not give legal advice. This is for educational and informational purposes only. And this is not creating an attorney client relationship at all with any of y'all. All right, that being said, I started out in 2002. I didn't know squat about real estate investing. So I went out there. I, I made some mistakes. We learned a little bit. I talked to folks over here. Find out what other investors that are buying want. Um, so you come to a, a difference in quality as far as uh, wholesalers out there who are trying to make put transactions together and they, they make mistakes out there. They learn from them or hopefully they learn from them. Um, and likewise with agents. I, I work a lot with real estate agents in the course of my early career. I partnered with one towards the end of the career because she didn't want to do all the disclosures and she I didn't want to become an agent. So that was a good relationship. Um, but working with agents, you get the same issue where you get someone who's not familiar with the real estate investing, they're good with the retail side of it, and you have to basically retrain them from, from the very beginning. Um, so you get a difference at, at quality level at, on both sides of the table. Now to address your, your issues, um, you have a contract for the purchase and sale of real property. Um, at that point, when you sign the contract as a principal, you have an equitable interest in, in the property itself. Um, and the seller has legal title to the property held as to assure that payment is made on the contract. Once payment is made, you have equitable title to the house and they have legal title which gets transferred. Now when you're assigning the contract like any other contract in business, whether you're assigning a, a series of payments where you're assigning a right to get receive payment on something else in another area of business, what you're assigning is rights and interests in that contract. So on payment of the assignment. When you're assigning the contract, the assignee, the one who's going to end up closing on it, has all the rights that you had in it. Now, it comes to an interesting point where, okay, title can't close for whatever reason. Now that's, a, that's an ethical issue between the wholesaler and the buyer, the, the, in, the end buyer. Um, are you guaranteeing that title will close or are you guaranteeing that you can have access to it. Do, you return the, do parties return the fees and unwind the transaction among themselves if there's a title issue? That's something that's negotiated. And if you don't have a well-drafted assignment, that, that can create issues as far as what happens whenever things go bad. Well, I, you exactly well. did that. When the contract can't, when the property can't close, my point is I've got to track down somebody who may or may not be there and get my $3,000 back. That is why it is better well, to deal with an actual person who's licensed. Well, but uh, so uh, on the other side, I'm going to take the wholesaler side on this this point. You know, there are good wholesalers and there are bad wholesalers. In my background, you'll know as a general contractor, there's good general contractors and bad general contractors. When I had fast track, you know, oftentimes we were taking half of of the payment. Let's say we're doing a forty thousand dollar rehab, we were getting half of that up front. That's twenty thousand dollars up front. Now, how many of y'all know through real estate education and all that, they say don't give a contractor any money? Right. You know, in five years' time and doing $5 million a year in business, we never screwed a single investor. Not not one. We, You know, it's a pristine reputation in that company. So it's a lot. I mean, and how many of y'all have been screwed by a contractor before? Anybody in the room? So it's no different from contractors versus wholesalers. And so there's good wholesalers out there and there's bad wholesalers, just like there's good general contractors and there are bad ones. So it's, it's a buyer beware in that situation. So and that, that is one of the things that I think that we're going to have to worry about in terms of regulation. Here's where I see that wholesalers really add value versus real estate agents. I don't think there's any real estate agent that's going to go after marketing $30,000 houses. Because a 3% seller's you know, listing fee on a $30,000 house is how much money? Yeah, in fact, it's, it's, it's $900. It's $900. So time you market and do all that, I mean, you're not making any money on it. That's why I laugh. Uh, Y'all know about lifestyles. They have agents on, a, on that help pigs out, right? It used to be that pigs got rebated back 40% of the real estate commission. So they had constant turnover among their real estate agents because if they're making 3% buyer's agent fee, 40% of it's going back to the pig. So they're, they're left with 60% of 3%, which was 1.8%, and they're splitting that with the broker 70-30. They're not making any money, and the average price of a rental house was about fifty or sixty thousand dollars. They're starving to death. They can't make any money. So I feel like that wholesalers can provide value when they're offering a a marketing of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar houses. The question becomes, 
Should a wholesaler market a $300,000 house and take a $5,000 wholesale fee, when being an agent, they would have made 3% of 300,000, which is 9,000 instead of 5,000. That doesn't make much sense. And I guess my biggest complaint about wholesaling is, I know that for our company, that we've done almost 200 houses now in three years. And we have a 100% closing ratio. When we look a seller in the eye, we say, we're gonna buy your house at $67,000, 100% of the time that we've sold, provided that the seller can provide clear title. I'd be curious on the wholesaler's side, what percentage of the time they look a seller in the eye and they bail the day of closing because they can't remarket that property. So because they pay too much on the contract, that when they go and sell it to other investors and there's not an investor that's what I call the greater fool theory, that they, there's not a greater fool out there to pay more than what they do. Because I've seen situations where we've looked somebody in the eye and say, look, I can buy your house at $40,000 and I'll close at that price and their house is going to auction on Tuesday. And some wholesalers offered them forty-five dollars or $50,000 and they don't close and they lose all the equity that they had in the house and the house goes to auction. And I, I feel like that is when consumers are getting screwed like that, that that's when regulators are gonna step in and say, you know, you're gonna have to have higher earnest money or you're gonna have to stand by your contract or your, those, those kind of things. That, as long as the consumer's being taken care of, and I think there's a difference between contracting a property I know Chris always uses the argument that, well, the consumer should know if I'm only giving them $10 of earnest money, Tom, they you, should you, know. You're making some really good points. But, but what I'll say is the consumer does not know, and if, that, if you're going to be honest with them, then option the contract instead of actually contracting okay. it. Right. We, we can't solve it all yet, but I have a question right here. Well, let me see. Young man there, and then the, the man in the black. So let's, let's go with the man in the black first, because I know he had his hand up. He's a plant. Uh, can, hey, can you just hand him but the I mic have, and then I'll get it back to you. But I have the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you, and you, and you bigger, but he's a realtor. He's a realtor. Actually, I have, I have a quick question. So if I'm a wholesaler who's not licensed, should I choose to, can I use a Trek contract? And if I can, can I assign it even though I'm not a licensed agent? Yes. 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 Track contract is promulgated by the Texas Real Estate Commission. It is open for use by anyone in the state of Texas or any product, matter of fact, anyone in the United States can use a track contract in the state of Texas. Um, so it's free and open there. Okay. We used it before I was an agent. And I use track as well whenever I'm doing wholesaling as well. I'm not licensed. My name is Alex uh, with Mr. Deeds House Buyers USA. I've been doing this for about 16 years. Uh, been always on this side. I'm actually taking all the courses to get my license just because I see additional benefit to it. Uh, I think what the mix or the misunderstanding what they were talking about here is when you're a wholesaler and you're not licensed, you put this property under contract uh, as an investor because I'm buying and, and fixing houses and rentals and that <coughs> thing as well, is on your agreement for your assignment, are you actually going to give that money back if, if, that, if that deal falls through? So I think with that, like my assignment contract that I've, I've modified through attorneys and over time, that, that way it protects me, the seller, as well as the buyer, then they know that they're going to get their money back if that title's not clear. Because ideally, a lot of times when a wholesaler, you guys that are not licensed, right, you guys, as soon as y'all get it under contract, you guys are calling, texting, email blasting, it's going out the door. You don't even know if that thing's cleared yet or not for title. With the, with the exception of some people that I know that actually have enough experience in the business and understand how to read the seller's deal and know that, yeah, there's not going to be any issues. But there's still that hiccup that you're going to come across because I've done so that, that as is, well. That's a really good question. So basically, I guess that our four panelists on this side, the only thing that they can answer is for themselves. But with the issue that he's brought up for yourselves, how, how would you handle the situation of the of the title issues. All right, I want to speak to two points. Uh, I'm going to speak to your point first, and I'm going to come back to Tom's point about uh, protecting the uh, clients. So I honestly think that you need to have respect for other people's time. And I'm not going to mention any names, but I had a buddy one time who <laughs> sent me out to look at a deal, and then he told me the deal was sold. And I was like, bro, what the hell? Like, come on, I went out to look at the deal. I sent it to two people. I sent it to two people, and it, and it was a, a little bit of a miscommunication. But at the end of the day, we cleared it up. And, and we cleared it up. But yeah, you know, at the end of the day, deals go fast, just as an FYI. 
because everyone sure. else knows. So I, I think what it really boils down to is if you're sending out deals and you've got no idea if it has clear title, what's going to happen is your investors are going to eventually say, hey man, look, you need to check your facts before you send me these deals because I put three of your deals under contract and none of them had clear title. You're wasting my time. So I think that's important. But again, I think it goes back to everyone doing their own due diligence. You know, are we going to phone pad the world? So that, are we going to take these posts out so someone doesn't run into them and sue us? I mean, seriously? So I think investors need to be responsible enough to go, hey, have you open title? That's what I do when I buy from a wholesaler. Have you open title? Can I see the title commitment? And the good investors will do that. And then they'll say, well, you know, I know you, I trust you, you have a good track record, like what DA was saying. Um, I feel comfortable giving you $2,000. That's a personal risk. You're going to pay a lot of retainers when you hire attorneys. You're going to pay contractors. That's a personal thing. The government cannot regulate if you're going to give someone money for services. I mean, that's you got to make your own due diligence. So, yeah, I think it's important that investors uh, do their due diligence when they're going to deal with the wholesaler, make sure it's got clear title, and be aware of wasting their time. Now, on to the second point before we get too off track. The other thing that we talked about is protecting the sellers. So let's say that the seller goes out and it says they want to sell their property, the investor comes in and gives them ten dollars. And then the investor doesn't close. And then the property goes to foreclosure and they lose their home. Okay? Getting licensed will not fix that problem. It will never fix the problem. Are there deals with licensed agents every single day, thousands of them, all across America that don't close? hundreds of thousands of deals that don't close. Are there agents that walk in and go, I think we can sell it for 250 Sign the listing agreement. That's not going to solve the problem, guys. And you know, and at the end of the day, there, there's wholesalers that will waste your time, and there's wholesale, and there's agents, just like Christopher said, that'll just tell you 250 so you can get the listing, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, it's buyer beware. You know, I'll tell you this uh, just from personal experience. If there's a wholesaler out there that's unwilling to work with you in terms of the earnest money and, you know, putting it at a title company, I'm willing to do it. I just need to know you're not a jackass. Right. <laughs> Are you going to turn away and, and run if, if something bad happens and try to take my money from the title company? No. And, and here's a solution that you can do. I know Christopher and... Ryan and a few other guys out here that do this, go to the title company and make the buyer, you take the earnest money or you put it at the title company. If you put it at the title company, you say, hey, listen, I need you to fill out this disclaimer. If something happens and you back out, guess who's dinero that is? Mio. Yeah. Mine. So that's a quick solution to take care of the problem. I'm never going to say, if Ryan calls me and says, Joe, I want to buy this deal, but you know what? That's a little shady of an area. Have you open title? No, you know what? It's still pending. There's seven. There's two thousand uh, heirs on it. And, you know, hey, let, let's just go ahead and you know put the earnest money at, at the title company. He says, good deal. I say good deal, and we do we do the agreement. So it's really just buyer beware, and you have to be really conscious of it. So. Right, before we go to the next next, I, I know Howard has the mic, but I have a young man here. Uh, this, this man right here. So Howard, if you could bring the mic up here, stand by him, and let, and let him ask the question, then I'll, I'll, I'll get your question. I'll make a comment, and then I'll give it to him real quick. Okay, so that, and that's why I really I want to make sure that he gets the question first before he gets your comment. So if I can have that, I'd much appreciate it. Thank you. Right here in the, in the page. It should be on. My question is, um, non-refundable earnest money or non-refundable option money versus just standard escrow money. Can somebody be more, more definitive on that? Because I see it all the time. Um, I have non-option money, usually $2,000, expecting the buyer to do his own due diligence, which I've done a lot of it myself. Most of the time, I know the deeds are clean, but I've already had them researched. Can you clarify the benefits or differences between the two and, and what's better than the other? I can tell you what I do. Uh, I basically call it upfront deposit of my assignment. 
because you know I, I know there's little nuances and, and probably get to that. But basically, I I don't sell real estate. I sell my interest in the deal. That's all I'm doing. And so if my assignment is ten thousand or eight, it doesn't matter. But if we agree that for me to, to, to lock the deal with you, two thousand dollars, I just call it an upfront portion of the assignment fee. Um, you know, most I would say most of my deals have not fallen through. If they do, if it's like something happens to sell or airship or something, I've given money back. Not much. I mean, it's only happened a couple of times. Does it but your assignment fee? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I'm I have a I have an LLC. I'm not just some you know. I, I, you can find me. I have a script tracing company, so I can find myself if you need me to. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I, I'm an honest. You know, and you have to gauge that as with any business transaction. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Howard's back here. He's got a comment. Yes. Well. Um, Rambo and I do a lot of business together. It's kind of, uh, we always, good cop, bad cop. Uh, she's a tough cop, I'm the easy cop, so. <laughs> we want your, we definitely want your deals from, and I've done business with a lot of you, and we have, uh, as far as the wholesale deals. And I understand that business and everything, and um, I will, uh, I mean, I've had guys call me and, hey, I tied up this property, you know, half an hour ago, would you think be interested? And, you know, I said, yeah, you know, but I look at it, I say yes, and I know that a lot of times they have title issues, that's part of the game. Uh, but I know if I wait for them to clear the title, uh, they may sell it to someone else. So it's kind of part of the deal. I always, I would prefer having the, you know, the uh, uh, assignment fee put with the title company, but if their policy is to hold it, then, you know, I'll, I'll go along with them because, I, you know, I'm looking for the deal. Now. If I've never dealt with them, I'll do a little checking, you know, to see if they will be around in case, you know, the property uh, does have title issues and drops out. Because I have heard circumstances where people have uh, taken the money and ran, and they, you know, the investor didn't get the money back. But that's something you have to just evaluate on the situation. So, um, you know, but uh, I'm a good guy, so Rambo's can be tough. You know, so. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Howard, real quick, uh, to your point up here. Yeah, Sam. How much earnest money did we take from you on our last deal? Zero. I think 3000 on one. Oh, I think on another Rambo. one, zero. Yeah, Rambo's got it right. We took nothing from you. Yeah, yeah. because we, we knew there was going to be airships and so, yeah. yeah. And I knew that if you guys say you want the deal, you want the deal. Exactly. Right? And that's, that's so. the thing, too, with uh, once you deal with, uh, like, I have a lot of wholesalers that, they don't even talk about earnest money. Right. They know. So, they know we're going to close or aren't going to close, and end the story. On the other hand, I know wholesalers yeah. that have gotten hung at the uh, day before closing. The buyer dropped out of sight. I've come in the situations where they said they called me up and said, "Howard, my buyer disappeared, and could you come in and buy the deal?" And I've literally bought the deal two days later. Yeah. And I've seen where wholesalers have gotten hung out there, and. Uh, you know, the buyer has disappeared. So there's so, two sides to that story. Exactly. So the other side of that is, and I think, I don't know, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I'm pretty sure all of us up here want to take a deposit in some form, whether we're licensed or not. Because for me, especially if we haven't worked together before, I want to take a large enough deposit where if you decide to walk away from our deal last minute, I want it to hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you're gonna go into that deal and I want you to run all your numbers up front so that when you put that deposit down, you know you're gonna get it. You know that you know you want that deal. So I just wanted to talk to that real quick as far as taking a deposit. I think you should take deposits. It should, should be careful in how you do it, who you give it to. You spoke a little bit about doing your due diligence on people, I agree 100%. So you're also buying up the property. You know, once you give that, that, that option, I mean, you're tying up that property. That wholesaler can no longer sell it to somebody else. Right. So if that person backs out, so his point is, his, before we go, his point is that whatever, whenever you talk to a wholesaler or to a, to a licensed agent, and you say I want this property, you're tying up property, so it's going to, it should cost you some money. Now, Terry, before you speak, I have a, I think, uh, I have a question here. actually. Well, before you before you ask a question, I have a, a question up here by Sasha. Sasha. So if I can get the <laughs> mic up here first, and then we'll have Terry. Mike is coming. So 
talking about regulations, I'm curious on both sides. Is it coming? What does it look like? And what does it mean to you? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, give your opinion. I don't know. Is, is there, okay, better question would be, is there actually legislation that's coming to the floor or possibly coming to the floor that anybody knows about? Well, the state legislature is out of session the next 18 months, so nothing for the next year and a half. Okay. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, to help that question, I have, I have something here from, that's been handed out by, uh, from the internet, and uh, Gerald, if you can just kind of really rough, yeah, so you know, so, so Gerald, I just want you to kind of address that, because it is, we, we're covering, covering which, which agency better protects the consumer. So is it going to be from the federal government? Is it going to be state? What's going to happen here? So, uh, Full disclosure, I have not read all 200 pages of the uh, new RESPA Act, so uh, the TILA RESPA, Integrated Disclosures. Um, so with that being said, this was presented to me this morning, uh, saying that they found assignments of contracts were found illegal at the federal level. Um, 26 out of how many? It doesn't say. Um, yeah, right. So we don't know what what context this is in and what jurisdictions we're at. So it's kind of hard to say, uh, get, give any kind of uh, idea of what this is approached. 26 assignments, assignment contracts found illegal at a federal level. What were the bases? No, no, no. This is, this is, so there would have to be bases. This is the internet, so... Take that with the <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even sure which six. Right. So let's talk about Dodd Frank. What what rules? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to do Dodd Frank. That's a whole other topic. That's a, that's yeah, a, I think that's what they kill. Uh, yeah. As far as assignments, assignments are, are I don't because assignments of contract are, are so per, pervasive in business, not just real estate. Not just real estate uh, industry, but also, I mean, throughout banking regulations, throughout uh, all kinds of commerce throughout the United States, any kind of, you'd have to really, really write a very specific piece of legislation to address this issue of wholesaling and real estate investment. Thank you. So uh, uh, you could, uh, just like with security regulations back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, because people were bad actors in the marketplace, and you get, that was affected millions of people at the time, and it still comes up periodically to regulate at the federal level, and even at the state level, uh, securities. Um, our market is very small compared to a lot, and even though it can have some pretty dramatic effects, uh, real estate, uh, the law of real estate, real property, goes back hundreds of thousands, of, well, no, sorry, hundreds, of, <laughs> hundreds of decades. <laughs> Um, and going all the way back to English common law. So trying to muck with the years at this point, um, at this fine level, it's going to be really hard for any legislator, any legislation to tackle. It can be done, but it's going to be with caution because we like oil and gas <coughs> in the state, and that's real property. And those contracts are assigned left, right, and center. Um, okay, so, I have the mic now. Okay, yeah, so we're going to let Terry go ahead and... and, and, and Okay. Yes, I have a concern that I would like to have addressed. My name is Terry Azuz. I'm with Remax Fine Properties, everybody. Um, I am a realtor and also an investor since 06. And I have been a part of the Rich Club since 2006. And when I first joined, we were told you should only be one or the other. You should not have your real estate license. Uh, within a month, I decided that it was more of a benefit. I just needed to disclose. So I, I think that we're having this debate about either or when it could be both, which is what some of you have said. You could have both and have that option. But my concern, we've already addressed the non-refundable earnest money, the deposit, whatever you want to call it. I personally have had people calling me saying that they've lost $5,000, $3,000 because of these stipulations. What I see is that a lot of the newbies are being fed upon by some wholesalers. I'm not going to say all wholesalers. Because I work with you wholesalers. Y'all know that. I work with a lot of you up there. Um, I love wholesalers. I don't buy anything that's on the MLS myself personally. I buy from my wholesalers. But I see that wholesalers feed upon the newbies, not only in this non-refundable deposit, but also in the numbers that are being presented. I look at deals left and right all the time. I got something across my desk this week that I was a little curious about. 
The numbers are crazy. They're off market. And the lady who called me who lost $5,000 is because she thought the numbers were legit and they were not. So how are you addressing that concern? Realistically though, is that really an agent question versus wholesaler question? That's a wholesaler question. So as so an agent, we could do the same thing. Wait, so so Terry, let me let me clear, let me clear. So if I can clarify your question, then is how how do you guys come up with your uh, is it the re, the rehab numbers? Your rehab, the, your AR, ARV, and the ARV, and yeah, all those and numbers. And, and to address your 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 question, Sam, as a realtor, yeah, I can go out there and say, oh, okay, you know, we I think we can get two fifty for this house. The numbers are here, the comps are here, but I think we can get this. But I know, I, first of all, I'm a real REMAX agent, and we're not trained to do that. We're not trained to push it to those limits. Uh, I have to have numbers that support me. You guys know that I do a lot of short sales. I always tell you guys, I have to have okay, numbers Terry, to support Okay, Terry, we're going to have to cut you off because we do have the well, question. Well, I'm, I'm want, answering his I want, question. I want, I, want, I want the guys to be able to answer, though. For, so the question about how do you come up with these numbers <coughs> of your rehab and your ARV? I, I come up with my initial numbers to do a deal. Now, one of my former coaches in this room, I mean, the way I was taught is I don't necessarily have to provide, and sometimes I don't hear, like I don't, I don't always say, hey, ARV in this house is 210, 45 in repairs. You know, you, you might be a contractor, you might have been a contractor for 20 years, and you can do it for 35. You might be brand new and you're gonna do an addition, and it's gonna take you 65 or 70. I mean, there's so many variables, so what I do is I don't really share, I mean, it's just speculation. At the end of the day, you're you're buying an asset worth a lot of money. So, I mean, it's a, it's a responsibility thing on the buyer to make sure it's a good deal. So, although I'm sure there's some nefarious activity to where people are going after earnest money deposits, I mean, my business model would, would, would crumble if I was just going after earnest money deposits, and I wouldn't be up speaking uh, on the stage today. Um, so, I think it comes to any, it's a, it's a personal responsibility to the investor. I even tell buyers, if, if I was gonna assign my interest, when they're asking me, I'm like, you know, I'm very careful. I, I don't want to tell them 40,000 and it's a 60,000 because they mess up and then they have, they have a contractor. You know, you can use different contractors, they're gonna have different price points. So that's not really a wholesaler problem. Um, unfortunately, there are, rep I mean, she could technically, I mean, there's laws, you can't defraud somebody. I mean, they can take with the small claims court or something, I mean, technically. But it's not really our fault if people are really buying good deals. But it comes down to due diligence. It comes down to due diligence. And, it, and, and the major wholesalers that are, are up here and the guys that are in the room that are major wholesalers, you'll find one interesting trend. That trend is 90% of them will not put an ARV on their emails. Now, why do we do that? Because just like Derek said, it's speculation. You know, we we know. For me personally, I buy I buy rentals. I've only got about four right now. But uh, a good buddy here, I won't mention names, but <laughs> but he's a he's a great friend in teaching me how to purchase property for rentals and running the numbers. And what I do, if it's a landlord deal, and I blast it out, I say, get get this. This is what I'm thinking. This is around 1200 for rents. This is what I think. I don't put the ARV. I say from what I see here on my numbers, you're looking at 10 or you're looking at 1100 to 1200 in rents. Now in big beautiful red letters at the bottom. Hallelujah. Play, praise Jesus. Do your due diligence. Do your due diligence. I'm not your attorney. I'm not your contractor. I have friends call me all the time. Joe, what do you think? What do you think about this? Uh, you think 60 grand? I said, dude, I don't know your contractor. I don't. Know. I've never fixed a beam in my life. I can't tell you, but I, I give you my estimate. But it, it, I'm not really worth anything. I'm not going to do it for you. I've got. Uh, I've got. Ray has the mic. I have this young man here with the, with the blue shirt, and then. And, oh, Mira, I've got, a, I've got a nice long list of questions here, so we'll, let's see what we can do. Um, wait, one thing. Wait, wait, before we do that, I'm, I'm going to let Ray, uh, you're going to ask a question or a comment, Ray? A, kind of a comment and then a question. Okay, Ray, come on now, you got you to help me out here, right? I only got 12. Uh, first of all, 
when you're when you're listing cheap houses, do net listings. It solves the problem, right? I mean, you can do the wholesale. The other thing is, and I'm glad that all y'all guys volunteer because I think this is an absolutely wonderful conversation, and it needs to be talked about. And I really enjoy Tom and Chris's since y'all kind of the bookends to the thing. But I think y'all are really talking about the essence of the problem because people are getting hurt, and there's just a line. Uh, that I have to say, it's just too good not to say. And Chris, you know I love you, right? <laughs> but Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Um, people are getting hurt because foreclosures are happening. The people are think they have their house sold. It's not sold, and the recourse against a wholesaler is zero. The retail, the uh, redress against a realtor is you can lose your license. You can be sued. There's a hundred thousand dollar fund for every claim made against a realtor, and so I'm not saying that wholesalers aren't necessary and aren't important. <coughs> but if the wholesalers don't clean up their act, it'll be cleaned up for them in a way that you, nobody will enjoy. Right. Okay. Let me just say one thing about the investment. That what Ray just spoke to is my heart bleeds for that way more than it does for these investors that are willy-nilly given five grand earnest money on a deal they don't know anything. We're investors. We're sophisticated. And if you're throwing, if you've got five grand to throw at a deal that you're going to make 20 grand on, you're sophisticated enough to know what's going on. So my heart bleeds for the homeowners that are getting into these deals thinking, well, you know, it said Better Business Bureau. It said this on their website. And, and here I am trusting some guy. And yes, that's sad. And, and, and I think if anything needs to be done, that's where it needs to be done. But I don't think that we should license that business because, again, it kind of goes back to what are we going to do, protect everyone from themselves. It's kind of like talking about, you know, you're going to take tourists on a tour somewhere and you're going to take them on a tour bus off the side of a cliff. They didn't know that. They thought they were going for a ride. Next thing you know, you're taking them on this tour bus. It's a rickety old thing falling apart. And you drive it over a cliff because the guy's drunk and there's no disclosure and it's not regulated and everybody's dead. That's a problem. But selling houses to investors that have money, that's not a problem. And people that are already screwed up in their house, and now they're trusting some idiot, and they haven't done their due diligence on them, and they're already behind in their payment, they're going to lose the house anyway, no matter what, and then they get into another situation, they lose it, that's, it's sad, but it's like, it's not the wholesaler's fault. He took a swing and he missed. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to address that, uh, address both Chris and Ray. Um, if you as a wholesaler, or you as an individual or company in real estate, goes out there, bought, puts the property under contract, you make certain representations to the seller that they're going to purchase this house and it's going to be take care of the foreclosure issue, and you reach your contract, you fill your performance, the house shows the foreclosure, you actually do have some recourse in the courts right. against that wholesaler. Right. Mm. You do, however, on your you do, but let's face it, someone that uh, is behind on the payments to the point of being foreclosed on doesn't have the money to go and hire an attorney, so they're going to rely on an attorney that's going to take it on contingency, and then it's going to be what are the assets of that wholesaler that has no money down, like when Joe uh, was getting started in real estate and he had nothing and his brakes weren't working on it. I mean, how, what, what are you going to get from that guy, right? More money. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I, I agree with the fact that real estate agents versus wholesalers aren't going to be able to protect the investor and I believe that wholesaling is for more experienced investors. I don't believe that rookies should be, in, in fact, you know, it's, it's one of the things, um, I think that uh, rookies, until they do their first or second or third deal, shouldn't even be looking to, to work with wholesalers. I, I, think, I, I think it's for more experienced investors, uh, but, but I am concerned about the, the seller of properties that I see over and over, and I'd be curious, if going down the panel, I mean, I'll start out, I'll tell y'all in advance, and we've had buyers that have backed out at the last minute, and just, you know, out of the 90 properties that we'll do this year, uh, about 12% of those we've wholesaled. And in two or three of those cases, the buyer backed out at the last minute, but when we look the seller in the eye and we say, we're going to close on this house, we'll close on the deal anyway. And, and a wholesale deal doesn't always have to be an assignment. We'll do wholesale deals where we actually close on the property and then turn around and sell it and we consider that a wholesale deal also. So I'd be curious, we've closed 100%, what's y'all's closing percentage now? 
Yeah, only exception okay, to that. Let's, let's if, do sell, this. if a seller it's can't a give their title. That's a good question. And really, I got to cut folks off. But it's a good question. So really quickly, if you guys can go down the list and just say, give us a number. Here. What is it you're asking for? The I'm closing, asking what's your closing percentage? Per per and, per and I'm not, take out the ones that a seller can't provide clear title. All right. Because that's on the seller side. But if, but you backed out as a buyer because the numbers didn't Although, work. Although, I mean, that may not quite be a fair question, but anybody wants to answer that? I will. And here's another thing. I just want to completely flip the paradigm for a minute. You go buy a house and you don't have the money to buy it. You get a loan. You promise someone you're going to pay them. Then you don't. Then you don't pay that person. And he wants to foreclose on you. He has that right. Who screwed who? The borrower screwed the lender. The borrower just screwed his lender, and now the lender's got to make hole on his deal. Right? So when you get foreclosed on, it is your own making. You made a promise to own a property and pay the property taxes. You made a promise to pay someone back, and you screwed them. So if you lose your okay, house, right. yeah, now exactly. you finish, you lose ding, your house, ding, 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 if you ding, lose ding, your house, ding, 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 Move those mics inside for a second. Let those guys rest. What's your question? Wait, wait, no, wait. No, we're not. We're not gonna answer that right now. I got a question from Alex. Who's been holding the mic just very patiently. So, Alex, go ahead. Uh, first, let me say I want to say thank you to all the panel. You're uh, really expressed some good views for the first time. Uh, thank you. But, however, let me say this. I am, and and I may not represent most of the people in here, but I am a newbie. I am a rookie, okay? And I'm at the point that I've established my business, I'm getting ready to make my first deal, and you just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I'm honest with you. I was thinking in the next couple of weeks I'm going to go out and do something. Well, everybody property everybody is scared shitless when they do their first deal. So, what I would like to know, coming from both sides, wholesaler and realtors, uh, I was looking at wholesaling as my start of my first deal, but I've heard as a rookie you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, with my view, of, I'm, I'm a very intelligent person, I'm a very strong-minded person, but should I go into that wholesaling business or should I go somewhere else? Yeah. No. No. Do what your heart desires. Yeah. Well, thank you. That doesn't take all the fear out of this at all. So, first of all, I'm not, on the, I'm not on the panel right now, but guys, these national gurus are all telling you to start in wholesaling. You don't know enough to be a wholesaler. You just purely don't. Go work with the wholesaler and learn. E education. And the thing is, there, there's people in here that you know will show you how to do it. Obviously, the Rich Club provides education, and, and I, I definitely suggest going to the Rich Club and learning as much information as you possibly can on some wholesaling. There's a way to do it. And obviously, as you heard today, there's a way not to do it. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I want to have some time for questions. we got 10 minutes, and everything's... Okay, so that is... Brandy. Brandy. My name is Brandy Wilcox. I'm a wholesaler. Um, this original discussion on Facebook kind of started with a problem that I had with, with regulation. I got... Uh, when it reported to the Trek police, and then we kind of found out a few more people were getting reported um, for selling real estate without a license. Um, and, I, and I don't believe that I do it any different than any of it, because matter of fact, I learned from some of you guys. Um, and we, of course, we had to hire an attorney, it's costing a lot of money, to find out that we just kind of have to put a disclaimer on there, which we kind of had, this was in the beginning, we didn't find out until like four months after the report. Um, but the lady got mad, a realtor, because we were selling a property in her neighborhood that happened to be on the MLS, um, flat fee listing. It was an investor that owned it and asked us to sell it. We had an option on uh, 48 hours, and the first person that called us bought it. Uh, but she was mad and made a report on us. Um, and so that's how this regulation thing started. How do y'all feel about us getting reported, um, or what should we do to prevent that, or are we just playing wrong? Or <laughs> so, the real issue is, our wholesalers acting as brokers, real estate brokers. Um, 
the occupational code, I mean, they list several things that you have to do, but it all basically boils down to, are you taking money to act as an agent for someone else? I don't want to say agent, I mean as under the law, uh, agent principle, uh, principle. Um, so what you're talking about, are you acting for someone else and getting paid to do so? If you're not, if you're a principal on a contract, you're not acting as a broker. Yes, we had under contract. If you had a contract on it, you're acting for your own interest. Now, the issue really comes as long as when you start making people confused by saying, I'm selling a house. You're not selling a house, you're selling a contract. If you're clear about your terminology and you make it clear that I'm making money on this, and I'm acting for myself, I'm not acting for you or anyone else, um, you're going to have a pretty hard time someone to make a case against you that you're acting as a broker. If you are if you are honest and have integrity when you're dealing with your seller, say, look, I'm buying this at a discount. Don't sugarcoat it for them. Don't say, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. No, if you, if you can't, don't say it. If you say it, do it. If you can't do it, tell them you may not be able to do it. But if you're honest with your sellers, and you're honest with your uh, real estate uh, retail buyer, your buyers, you're pretty much going to be in the clear on most issues with the state of Texas. But you can't stop them from reporting you. And well, having to I've been reported them. twice, okay, right. since I told you I had my license in February. Right. And <laughs> so here's the beautiful thing. I've been reported twice. I have done... I have found to be in the clear both times. Uh, agents, one time was an agent where we disclosed every, I mean, we disclosed everything to the agents when we buy off the MLS. We told her exactly what we were doing. We screwed up because we used her pictures, oh. right? So we don't do that anymore. But we got a, we got a uh, call from Trek. She's like, and the, actually the first call was from the agent. She said, hey, if you're gonna do that, don't use my pictures. I said, okay. So we don't do that. But she still called Trek to get clarification. They called us. They said the same thing, don't use pictures. And we had a very pleasant conversation, frankly. Um, and the next time, I just got a call directly from the Trek guy, hey, what are you doing? I heard about this transaction, you're wholesaling this property on the MLS, that was from the MLS. I said yes. He said, uh, okay, just send me your marketing piece right. and send me your contracts. So I did that. Calling back the next day, we wound up talking about racing. Like, it, it, because we covered our butt. Because all our T's were crossed, all our I's were dotted, and everything was there. Yeah. I mean, when I got that call from Trek, I mean, I, I was like, whoop! You know, yeah. oh crap. But when you sit there and you call them, and I go back through everything, and I realize that everyone on the team did the right thing, then it's not a scary call anymore. Yeah. You know, you're learning a tough mistake. Uh, and that's, you know, we're, you're learning about disclosure. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're a bad person, necessarily. Uh, but best of luck to you, but from someone who's been reported a couple times to track, it's not that scary as long as you're covering your butt. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, I got, can I, I jump got, in real quick before we do that? I got one, I got this last question, and then guys, what we're going to do after this question, you're going to, you, you, you've got, you got the, the final answer, then I want everybody else to go ahead and, and give out your, once again, your name, contact information, and we're going to have to close. So, thank you for the last question. My name is jkjulian.com. I'm a real estate broker and an appraiser, so if anybody's looking to hang their license or get a license, come see me. I'm investor friendly. Yay. Uh, was that a was that All right. question? All right. I just want to make one, one statement, too. Just, just for, well, two things for, regarding the whole uh, license versus non license. One thing. Obviously, everyone has a moral compass that they should, right? So we're governed by that. But I do want to point out, just because you're a realtor, there was a, a story this year in March or April or May, 14,000 licensed agents in Houston have criminal records, okay? 14,000. Now, <laughs> but the point, you know, that means anything from small stuff, but there is some big stuff for people. There's agents that have done fraud checks for up to 30,000. I mean, it's all documented in the store. You can look it up on Google. How can they get their license? Yeah. Track up through them. That's the whole, that's the whole point. Now, now all, all I'm saying, I'm not, but then there's wholesale. So it just it doesn't mean there's uh, license, uh, licensed people. Are all good. Yeah, you know, they're all angels running around doing stuff. So I just wanted to put that contrast out there. And Sam, I wanted to acknowledge you for something because you're the first licensed agent that I ever heard of that 
if you look at track subsection 535 where it says it has a the track rules <laughs> when it says agents that are going out after on their own as principal they're supposed to be showing bpos and or comparable cmas to to sellers and I would highly doubt if we took a survey on that, that agents are going to a seller saying, hey, I'll buy your house for 40, here's a CMA, it's worth 80, I can list it, but sell it to me for $40,000. I highly doubt that's going on. But I mean, that's in track rules. I mean, so there's so many nuanced things. I mean, we can get really nitpicky, but I just wanted to point those out. So you did mention that, now it's cool. How about you about the roast <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's, let's go, let's we'll start here, and just once again, your name, contact information and uh so let's because we're gonna have to wrap it up chris funk uh chris at funkdeals.com the only last closing remark i have is if you're finding your buyers first and then you're going to find them a deal bill bronchick wrote a very interesting article on that that kind of quacks like a duck all right joe tomaselli from joe buys houses reach me at my email or cell 832-427-2703. Alton Glenn from Don MLS Property. Uh, my contact information is Alton at B Altex Group, T-H-E-A-L-T-E-X-G-R-O-U-P dot com. You can also find me at offersignsold.com. If you're looking for properties, uh, feel free to visit my website and you can uh, put your email Derek Morrell, Good Faith Home Buyers, and my email is Derek, D E R E K, at goodfaithhomebuyers.com. I also own American Tracers, a skip tracing company, for private investigators here in Texas. Um, that's www.americantracers.com. Phone number. Phone number. I'll tell you what. Get his card after. I'll, I'll give you my Google Voice number. Or I have I have business cards up here. I'll give them to whoever. Comes, wants to their cards are available. Show us your gun. <laughs> my name is Gerald Ehlers. J E R E L E H L E R T. My number is 832-524-1173. My email address is Gerald at GeraldEhlers.com. Thank you. Uh, Sam Craven, Senate House Buyers. Uh, I just wanted to say real quick that I respect the hell out of everyone on this stage, and I really, I really, really enjoy this back and forth. Uh, and I also want to leave with a little bit of a kind of a closing statement. One thing that we didn't get to talk about, I kind of touched on in my initial introduction, that we think of our company as a marketing and sales company. When I'm able to, or when my people are able to go into a house and say that they're a realtor, and say that they hold themselves to a higher fiduciary responsibility, however the heck you want to define that, but you do get to say that to the seller, we are able to build a rapport faster than maybe someone who doesn't say that. So just think about that. Consider something like that. My, again, Sam at S-E-N-N-A housebuyers.com. Always looking for private lenders, always looking for more deals. Thanks for coming, guys. Again, my name is Ryan DeGennaro with Core Management Group. Ryan, R-Y-A-N, at my core online. Um, any experienced agents out there looking for a new place to hang their license, we have great splits and great support. So come find me out. Thank you. Tom Perry with uh, Houston House Buyers. It's Tom at HoustonHouseBuyers.com. Guys, this has been a great, great program, don't you think? Yes. For people that are not members here, this is what goes on at the Rich Club. <laughs>